In this section, we're going to talk about the specific exercise principles. There's a great section in your uh, books that will go over this, and you are expected to know all of these definitions and then to also be able to apply them to your prescription and design of a plan of care for your patient. So let's just start with individuality, right? This, I mean, this is common sense. It makes sense that every person is going to respond differently. In previous lectures, we have talked about that there are genetic differences and there's anthropometric differences and there's uh, biological age versus physiological age. So making sure that you have a program that's unique to the person in front of you is essential. Uh, you can start to use evidence to guide you. So we know that to limit the upper trap from turning on that performing side lie external rotation is actually the most effective. So what that means though is I need to assess if my patient needs uh, external rotation strengthening. I can't just assume all people with rotator cuff pathology need that. I also need to understand if my patient can lay on their side or not. So make sure that you're uh, applying that that principle of individuality. You'll start to see this as you guys go into some of your clinical rotations and when you start to work is that there are there are practitioners out there that are, you know, if someone comes in with low back pain, they're given the same six exercises. Unfortunately, guys, it's doing nothing for our profession um, to advance us, to help people understand that we should be preferred providers. So really uh, start with that art of listening and make sure you have a good program that's to the individual. Trainability. So this really helps us understand that everyone is going to respond differently to a training stimulus, much in part because we don't know where someone is, uh, you know, we do, we will find out where they're starting. So we'll find out where they're starting, what exercises they've done, but don't expect the same result from every single patient. You need to monitor and adapt those exercises to make sure that they're appropriate for your patient. And that's why you really you need to analyze their movement. So even if you're working, doing some manual therapy on one of your patients, please be watching your patient perform exercises. They need you. They need your brain. Um, and understand that everyone's going to adapt differently to your training stimulus. Some people might need more time. Some people are going to respond very quickly uh, to, your, to your stimuli that you gave them. This is just an example of how males and females will change over time. Um, so if you look, it's developmental age. And, uh, and so as we age, we're going to peak at different levels, right? So if you look, it's showing that females are really peaking um, in their uh, early teens, as whereas males are peaking in their later um, teens with certain aspects. So with, and then understanding rate of growth. And just, just a r- reminder that it's not just um, where someone is at and that everyone's going to respond the same. So we might think about a 30-year-old versus a 20-year-old versus a 10-year-old. All very different stimuli are needed for them and different progressions, rate of progressions for them. Specificity is a hot button, right? We all know that ACL rehab has become um, really a hot ticket item for this and understanding that. What I want you to think about, though, is all the different ways in which you can maximize your programming specific to the needs of the patient. So are you performing the traditional like bilateral external rotation, but it's a swimmer, so maybe we can get creative, put them in prone, make them work on their core a little bit more in the in the environment that they need to so that it's not just doing uh, this is with someone, but you're really thinking about specificity for the sport. This is essential in our functional um, return to sport area of of rehab. And again, sometimes we're releasing people too soon from rehab. Keep them coming in. They might not have to come in as often, but let them come in. This is also really fun time for you guys to to do that. We know that, um, that from the said principle that we have to have those imposed demands incorporated into our programming so that they're actually going to get better. Overload. It's probably one of my favorites to just r- remind everyone, practitioners, students, um, that we have to have the load, increase the load to see adaptation occur. So if you're picking 
three sets of 10 for every single patient, for every single problem that they have. You're never progressing them past that. You're not getting into the overload principle, okay? Our body has to have this to see muscle growth, strength gains, and improved performance. So you need to make sure that you're looking back thinking about, did I progress this? Have I stuck with three sets of 10 for the last four months? And they've been doing a squat. So you guys are doing a great disservice to that. And you can do better than that. So do better than that. Be thoughtful in your programming. But you have to overload the system for it to improve. For continued results, you have to have a progressive overload. So you have to do a little bit more over time. Now, you're going you're gonna to reach the ceiling, right? So now maybe you change your stimuli to where you're doing different sets, different reps, different speed. You're adding a little bit different um, type of phenomenon in there for your patient that way, okay? Variety, our brain functions on variety. So uh, my husband's grandma, she walks 30 minutes every single day, and that's her exercise. Well, she got in a car accident recently, and she started to um, really think about that she wasn't doing any balance training, neuromotor training, um, she started to add in Pilates and yoga and you guys, it was so hard for her. Um, and she thought she was doing such a good job walking every day. It just wasn't enough. So our programming is much the same. You have to have progression of your exercises and there should be a variety in your exercises. You should still have the same theme. Uh, so if you think I got to strengthen quadriceps, quadriceps are really weak. We know that contributes to osteoarthritis of the knee. That's my main theme, but I can think of 20 different exercises that are going to be uh, effective to strengthen the quad. So this thing, I can add variety into that that helps our neuromuscular system and proprioceptively enhances our programming. Okay, so don't forget, sleep is hugely important. Please talk to your patients about it. If they have poor sleep habits, Make a, make a program for them. Make a little, um, give, give a pamphlet. There's lots of information out there. Most adults need seven to eight hours of sleep. So if they're not getting that or if they have poor sleep habits, if they're doing their phone before they go to bed, um, that can really affect their, uh, their recovery. Sleep is when we um, tend to repair, right? So it's our, our recovery and repair. So even educating your patients on that, Sleeping is where your your body actually repairs itself, and so we need actually to focus on that just as much as we focus on everything else. So the principle of reversibility is basically if you don't use it, you're going to lose it, and that you will, once you stop exercising, the benefits of exercise um, will reduce or completely stop. So you do have to keep exercising. They did a study with rats where they injected them with a neurotoxin. And if the rats were exercising every day, they actually didn't develop Parkinson's disease. But the very day that they stopped is when Parkinson's disease started to take effect in the brain of that rat. So uh, we have similarities with, with, with our um, rat uh, family. And so that they've now applied that to thinking about our brains and that we have to use exercise as medicine in the same way. So uh, maintenance is kind of unique in that the sense that you can exercise at the same intensity while reducing the volume to maintain the gains you have. So once you reach that optimal level of fitness, you can actually reduce some of that um, intensity. You still have to have the same volume though. So when you're programming, think about that and for your patients and your clients. We know that we're going to hit a ceiling um, and we have the law of diminishing returns. So but what's cool is a lot of our patients are going to come in and they'll see huge gains because either they're, they haven't been exercising or because of injury and atrophy, you're going to see pretty big gains with them. With, a, with someone who's a really elite and they've maximized their potential for strength, um, you're going to see smaller gains, but you still can see gains within that. Uh, interference. So you really, you can't have it all. Um, they've done lots of studies showing that if you want to have strength and hypertrophy, then you can't be, you can't have all that aerobic conditioning. Um, now you can still train aerobically. You can still, um, have a good cardiovascular program, but you can't be elite 
in that sense. Like you're not going to take your marathon runner and they're not going to be the strongest person in the world either. Same thing, right? If you think about the strongman competition, they're not going to be there. They're not going to run very fast and very long. So just think about that when you're training, keep to the forefront what your biggest rock or biggest impairment is and make sure you're trying to address that with your patients. Okay, always come back to your stages of healing. Make sure you're not flaring your patient up. Uh, Turn fear into confidence. So let's just say you're working with someone on balance. They're very afraid because they've fallen and they have always fall forward. Well, maybe you start in more of a static uh, environment where you put them on a ramp type of scenario and they have to just hold that statically. Scale it back. Let them hold on. Then start to, to... Take some of that away. Start to build that confidence in the clinic with you. Make sure their home exercise program is helping them, but they're not afraid to do it. Start with success. Work in the planes that are effective and efficient for them. Then start to introduce those other planes of motion. Uh, Incrementally load and then always try to use those um, words of motivation and education to help your patient. Lastly, just a few tips. Um, create opportunities for confidence and success. So maybe there's an exercise that has become your test and this was very hard for your patient to do. Well then, and you know that they're going to just be better at it, make that part of your test retest during your session. That helps your patient, okay? Uh, Create opportunities for autonomy. So the more your patient is involved, um, the better your patient is going to be after you are done with them, once you complete their plan of care. You don't want to make it so driven by you that they're not actually doing any of it on their own or thinking about it or problem solving through that, okay? Create opportunities of relatedness. So what does that mean, relatedness? Well, this is where I come back to their goals. So if you're having someone do a plank, what to, how does that relate to them? Maybe they've never gotten on and off the floor. They haven't done that in forever. Why, do, why would they care about doing a plank? So you have to use your clinical rationale and motivation to help them buy into the program that you're doing, which is just going to make you that more, much, much more successful. Okay, you guys, great job. Section three is done. Make sure you do understand all the definitions of these and uh, be ready to apply them to your programming.